I am Mike Winger, a pastor in Southern California, and this is 20 Questions with Pastor Mike. What we do is take your questions live from the YouTube chat, which are pouring in at an alarming rate, a concerning rate at the very moment right now, and I will answer 20 of them today. But I do have the first one ready to go already, and that is from Do, do Tales or Do Tales, who asks, you said in a past Q&A session that Jude references Enoch. And your best explanation is that it's just to make a point, not to say that Enoch is canon or inerrant. But that's also my conclusion about when Jesus refers to the Old Testament. Isn't it the same for when Jesus refers to the Old Testament? So just to clarify the background of this question, we're going we're gonna to answer the question of what's Jesus' attitude about the Old Testament? Did he think it was like inspired scripture? Um, but for the background, the Enoch question, I, I, I dealt with this earlier, but Jude <clears throat> speaks... Um, a reference to the book of Enoch, which is not included in the Jewish canon of scripture or the Christian canon of scripture. Like we don't see this as scripture. It's an intertestamental book. It's kind of complicated. Basically, I think Jude, we can say is making an illusion that does not call out Enoch as scripture. And one of the reasons I gave several, but one of the reasons I made this case is because he doesn't call it scripture. When Jude uses this reference, he doesn't say scripture says. Um, he doesn't say the Holy Spirit says or something like that. Now, when it comes to Jesus, when it comes to Jesus and the way Jesus talks about the Old Testament, uh, I'm actually, I am, to be honest, Dotales, I encourage you, please just read the Gospels and notice how Jesus talks about the Bible, the Old Testament in particular. Over and over again, Jesus says things that make it unequivocal, like you, you, can, you can't get around it. Jesus thought the Old Testament was God's word. Right. And, and that was his opinion on the matter. And obviously he knows. <laughs> and so, for instance, um, he constantly says scripture says referring to the Old Testament. Now, calling it scripture doesn't isn't a generic term the way we would think today of calling something a writing. Well, it, it, you know, there's a writing, there's a book that says, but this was more of a technical term for this is this is scripture. Right. The same way that I use the term nowadays when I say, hey, scripture, I mean, it's God's word. He also would say things like um, well, let me give you an example here. This is Mark 12, verse 36. Look at what Jesus says. David himself in the Holy Spirit declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Jesus here quoting from the Psalms, he says two things about the Psalms. He says it was David who said it, and he says how David said it, the way in which David got the writing in the Holy Spirit. That means he thought that David had written this Psalm, and he thought that the Holy Spirit had empowered David to do it, which is exactly what our doctrine of scripture is, is that all scripture is God breathed, right? It's from the Holy Spirit ultimately. So this is um, a good example of where Jesus definitely had a very high view of the Old Testament scripture. Do you know Jesus quotes from all sections of the Old Testament? He quotes from the, the three main sections of the Old Testament. He, he quotes from the law, from what you would consider, nowadays I would often consider like the ceremonial parts of the law, also the moral parts of the law. Some would argue with those um, expressions, but I think that they're helpful. Um, Jesus, he continually says things like, I'm going to die because the scripture has to be fulfilled. And then he refers to Isaiah and he refers to Daniel and he refers to Psalms, right? He constantly appeals to the Bible, the Old Testament, the Jewish Bible as scripture. Then he says that the Holy Spirit will help his apostles as they communicate his truth, his message to others. And that's how we get our New Testament scripture. So there's the first question. I'm going to uh, encourage you to go back, do tales, read, please do read the tale, <laughs> read the stories of Jesus and notice how he refers to scripture as a, from like a pastor standpoint. It's very a different issue to ask, oh my, what's happening in the life of a person who thinks that they believe Jesus, but they don't believe the Old Testament. That's concerning to me, like pastorally, because I, I think that it's an open door for a lot of weird things to happen. Because here's what I've noticed happens once we lower our value of the word of God, once we lower our estimation of scripture, what we tend to do, and I mean, we, like I've seen it many, many, many times, is we tend to have a gap. There's an authority gap in our life, right? Uh, telling us what it is that we should be holding to as Christians, behavior-wise, all these different things. And the minute you lower your view of the Old Testament or the New Testament, what happens is something floods into that gap. And what usually floods into that gap is either modern cultural preferences or personal desires and agendas that might go against the stuff that you're actually reading about in the Bible. So what I'm suggesting is there pastorally here, there's like a, 
there's a temptation moment for you when you lower your appreciation and respect for God's word that you, you, you fill in the gap with the desires of your heart that could be leading you astray. And so uh, I pray that you would take that very seriously. All right, number two, A&Q says, a and Q. Sorry, that's our new code for anonymous question. If you ever want to ask an anonymous question, put A and Q in front of your question and then write out your question in the comments. It says um, Romans 1 8 through 2 16. Responsibility. I'm afraid to read slash not read the scriptures, so I read slash don't read. Sometimes I feel physically ill, deeply anxious, even empty. Is it normal to feel like this? <clears throat> I'm I'm confused as to the uh, on the question. Um, so you you quote a passage of scripture, Romans one eight through two sixteen here, um, and then you say responsibility question mark. I don't know what I don't know what the question is there. Um, then you said I'm afraid to read slash not read the. Are you, so it sounds like you're afraid to read the Bible and you're afraid to not read the Bible. I think I can understand that. Um, and sometimes you get to the point where you're feeling physically ill, deeply anxious, and even empty. Is it normal to feel like this um, about reading and not reading the Bible? Um, okay, let me go to this text. I, I, look, I realize that this might bog down for some of you your enjoyment of this stream a little bit, but I want to help this person. So I'm going to go to Romans 1 and see if I can suss out a better understanding of exactly what it is you're, you're talking about here. Um, he talks about the proclamation of the gospel. I'm just going to be scanning through here, trying to think about it in the context of your question. Um, yeah, he's not ashamed of the gospel because it brings God's uh, salvation through faith. Because guess what? God's wrath has already been revealed. We're all already condemned because of our ju the, uh, the sins. And those of us who judge others self-righteously, we reveal that we know about righteous judgment and we fall short as well. That's Romans 2 there. Um you go through 16, that moves into a next section, which is people who sin without the law will perish without the law, and all who sin under the law will be judged. Okay, th so the, my best guess here is that maybe, and forgive me if I'm wrong. Okay, I'm doing my best. Maybe you're thinking, I'm afraid that if I read the Bible, I have a greater accountability. And so I want to not read the Bible, so I won't have the accountability. Because you say responsibility. And this passage talks about accountability. Uh, here's the problem. Romans 1 and 2 here actually seems to go against what you're saying. It suggests that you're going to be accountable whether you read the Bible or not. And um, those who don't read the Word of God, don't understand the Scriptures, have never been exposed to it, they'll be accountable for the revelation God's given them through conscience and nature and whatever the Holy Spirit has done in their lives. And those who've read the Bible have additional revelation, and there is additional condemnation if you reject additional revelation. But here's the problem. If I have a Bible and intentionally don't read it in order to avoid condemnation, I'm not, I don't get a, a get out of jail free card now because I have revelation and I'm choosing to ignore it because I don't want to submit to it, right? So that's not an innocent thing. That's not even who Paul's talking about in Romans uh, 1 and 2. He's not talking about a situation where someone has the Bible and chooses not to read it as a way of avoiding judgment. That is, in other words, what I'm going to suggest is it's understandable but you're going through some really weird thoughts and those thoughts need to be filtered by the truth of God's word and maybe go and meet up with a pastor in your area or, or it doesn't have to be a pastor, but just some godly person who, who is thoughtful and wise who will listen to you and help you work through some of these thoughts. My counsel off of what little information I got from question number two is you're feeling physically ill, deeply anxious. You, you, you're like afraid to read the Bible, afraid to not read the Bible. If you're, you're, you're experiencing a lot of fear. That is not natural. That is not normal. It is not healthy. But I, from the distance of my camera to wherever you are right now, would have a very hard time giving you real thorough counsel to like dig into your issue and find out, is, there, is this the work of the Spirit in your life giving you fear because there's areas you know are in huge rebellion to God? Or is it the work of fear and condemnation that has no basis in reality, that's barring you from enjoying the grace that you have in Christ? And I don't know the difference because you need to talk to someone who can sit with you. So please, please meet with them. And my, my generic answer is, if you're living in open rebellion against God, the fear is justified. And if you are trying to seek the Lord and follow God, though you don't do it perfectly, but you are in a lifestyle of seeking God, then you should not be living in that fear. And there are scriptures that validate both of those statements. I think you need the wisdom to be able to discern what your situation is 
so that you can act appropriately. But the fact that you're frozen by fear proves that your fear is unhelpful and unhealthy right now. And I don't want you to stay in that place. So you need to take action and not be frozen. God give you wisdom. And I hope you seek out some counsel. Um, CDTV has a question. says, thank you for everything you do here. What are your thoughts about Matthew 26, 13? You taught earlier that the specific action is not even recorded in all the Gospels. So what does Jesus mean? Let me go to the passage. Matthew 26, 13. And surprisingly, I have every verse in the Bible memorized except for this one. It's the only one I don't have memorized. Right. Verse 13 says, Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be will also be told in memory of her. Okay. Um, backing up, your, your thought is, let, let's go to your, your evaluation of the passage. You're going to say, hey, um, this action is not recorded anywhere. Like we never hear in the in the Bible. We don't hear anybody doing telling the story of her. But let me say that there may be some perspective you're missing here. So let me just catch everybody up on what we're reading about. This is Jesus being anointed at Bethany towards the end of his ministry. A woman takes this really expensive ointment and pours it over Jesus and they complain. And then Jesus is like, hey, she anointed me for my burial. Leave her alone. And what she has done is going to be spoken out, spoken about wherever the gospel goes. Now, if I go to the book of Acts, I don't actually read about anybody specifically, you know, it's not like Peter got up in Acts 2 to preach the gospel and he preaches to the people and it's recorded where Peter goes, and there was a woman from Bethany. You know, he doesn't, we don't have that rec recorded in Acts 2 or in Acts 5 or Acts 15 or Acts anywhere. It's not in the book of Acts. But I think here's where we're missing the forest through the trees. You see, from the very beginning, the gospel has been attached to the testimony of the apostles and their testimony is ultimately recorded and solidified or permanent, made permanent in the words of scripture. And, and for 2,000 years, now all over the place, wherever the gospel has gone, so has the New Testament, so has the Old Testament. But in particular, what, is, what was most early circulated and circulated most frequently are going to be, well, Paul's letters, but also the four gospels, right? The four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What I'm saying to you is CDTV, what you might not have noticed, is that um, this verse where the gospel went, you, you either very early on before the gospels are written, you had the apostles themselves telling the stories, which would have included this. And then when the apostles were leaving the scene and we get the writing of the writings are, you know, what Justin Martyr called the memoirs of the apostles, interestingly, um, you have this story being told all over the place. And here, here right now, we have hundreds and hundreds of people watching as I've just shared it again. There's this woman who did this thing for Jesus and it was great, you know. So you, what you may not have realized is that y he, Jesus doesn't say, I will make sure to have you guys record several instances of this story being told in the New Testament. <laughs> Rather, he keeps the story in the New Testament and wherever the New Testament goes, so the story goes as well. I think that um, you might have missed the, the forest through the trees right there. I hope that helps you. Hopefully you find that um, helpful. Wait, I think I mixed something up. I answered number five when I should have answered number three. And then now I'm going to answer four as number five. <laughs> Good luck, Sarah Zimmerman, doing the, doing the, doing the timestamps later. I did three, four, and five in reverse order. Um, okay. Vinay Oguri says, um, or anyway, you'll figure it out. Vinay Oguri says, when, uh, what was the point of capital punishment in the Old Testament, which was way too harsh to the point that it was not strictly followed back then? How does it display God's love when people are killed for not obeying? Um, so Vinay, uh, one of the important things I think when we approach these discussions is the person who asks the question often frames the discussion. So there's a lot that your questions always assume things. Every question assumes things. So like, for instance, if I said to my wife, like, uh, what time are you cooking dinner tonight? Well, that assumes that she's cooking dinner, right? That, doesn't that assume something? There's questions that assume things. Your question assumes several things. Um, capital punishment in the Old Testament was A, way too harsh. B, because it was too harsh, morally wrong, is what you're saying. Um, it was not followed by the people back then, not just that it wasn't followed, but that because it was too harsh, it wasn't followed, morally too harsh. And then your your next thought is, how does it display God's love? And there are a few different things, which would be the idea that perhaps um, every single thing God does must be obvious, it must obviously display his love somehow. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure if I would 
follow with that, although I think we can we can make a case that capital punishment in the Old Testament displays God's love because I think God's love is holy and God loves holiness. He doesn't just love you. So me just loving you to the exclusion of others around you, that would mean I could never punish you, like unless it was to your benefit, right? But there could never be um, retributive punishment. That's what they call ret retributive. It's, this is punishment that's not meant to like restore or fix you. It's just meant to pay back. Like I couldn't do that if I if I loved you above all else, just you. Nobody else but you, that old song. Um, so that would be impossible if you were my world. You were the only one I loved and the only thing I loved. But imagine an environment where you love more than one person. And like say you have three kids and your kids sometimes mistreat each other. And you have your spouse and your spouse is, is, is there as well. And so let's say that your kid hurts the other kids. Your spouse tells them, hey, stop it. And they talk back to your spouse. Now there can be a retributive reason to punish this kid. Right, but hey, this is just wrong. You you can't talk to my who I also love, my spouse, who is in right position of authority over you. You can't talk to them like that. Go to your room. This may or may not fix their attitudes or behavior, but it's not the only purpose of the punishment. Sometimes it's about making things right. So I think that um, all that being said, I think God does demonstrate love even in capital punishment, but not just love towards the person who's getting punished, but also love towards his own goodness. Love he, in the Trinity, we have mutual self-love that's going on that's, that's selfless and because there's multiple persons within the Godhead. So there's like a selflessness in God's self-love because of the th tri-personality of God. So I, I think that we, we have to acknowledge that too. Um, there are times where a child is punished because he's not the only human in existence. And it's not always to, to make him act better, although you hope it does. So capital punishment can be for that purpose. You also said it was morally too harsh. I actually don't think that that's the case. Um, I know this totally kicks against the major maybe the majority of my audience right now. Let me just suggest this. Um, proper justice always seems too harsh to criminals. This is pretty much always the case, at least the majority of the time. Most criminals will complain that the justice system is too harsh on them no matter how soft it is. Because those who are on the receiving end of punishment have a lot of motivation to say the punishment shouldn't have been given to them. And we being sinners, deserving God's wrath, we have a natural inclination to turn to look at God's wrath and say, you know, I don't think I deserve all that. I think that's way too mean. That's way too harsh. That's way too strong. But if you stop for a second and you look at it not from the perspective of humans, but from the perspective of a holy, righteous, perfect God. God is perfectly holy in every conceivable way, both in his actions and in his motives. He's completely holy. And we are so messed up. Like Jesus himself calls, calls us like evil. Like when he's talking in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, um, you know, you being evil, you still give good gifts to your children. Now I want you to stop for a second and think, Jesus is evaluating humankind how exactly? He's like, come on, he's like taking for granted. Like, come on, you guys being evil, you still give good things to your children. You still give good gifts to your children. How much more your heavenly father wants to give you good things. Um, this perception from the biblical perspective that mankind is a lot worse than we often will admit, that's an important doctrine in Christianity. You know, if I put it clumsily, I would say like, people are way worse than they think they are. That's an important doctrine biblically. People are far worse morally than they think they are. So when it comes to the assumptions, I have to push back on that and say, I, I don't grant your assumption in your question. When your question says, um, capital punishment in the Old Testament was way too harsh, I think capital punishment in the Old Testament might be the thing that's helping reveal how wicked mankind is. And this this is this is what the old the scripture does with the Old Testament. How does the New Testament tell us the function of the Old Testament? Its function with our with our conscience is that it awakens my conscience to show me how bad my sin really is. This is huge. I hope I hope I'm making this point clearly and carefully for you. When I read in Romans 7 about the function of the law in Galatians about the function of the law, the the purpose of the law of the Old Testament was not, hey, this is too harsh. Instead, it was, look, when I give you guys rules to follow, look how much you fall short. This shows you how bad you are. 
That, that's how you find out how bad people are, right? Give them rules. <laughs> find out find out if they if they obey them. Um, alternately, give them no rules and see how they behave. Uh, these are the two the two ways to test a community. Um, and uh, and we, we fail in both counts every time we get in, into one of those scenarios. So the function of the law is to show me I'm really messed up. Now, I think your question, Vinay, for, sorry if I'm, I'm, I'm laboring on your point a little bit, but I think it's a really good point. I think a lot of people have the same question as you. I hope this is going to help bring clarity. Even if the majority of my audience doesn't agree with me, I just think y'all are wrong. And I really want you to change your minds on this, so I'm going to labor on it. Um, so, Vinay, what I would say to you is... Um, when you look at the Old Testament and you see capital punishment, you think it's too harsh. I would suggest it's appropriate. It's appropriate. And it's meant to show you that sin is that bad. Right now, is gathering sticks on the Sabbath really that bad? No. But the Old Testament gives you a different context. It's gathering sticks on the Sabbath after you have made a covenant with God not to. Do you understand? That's the context. You made a covenant with God that you would rest on this day to honor the Lord who, you know, rested on, on the seventh day, right? So you're, you're not just gathering sticks, right? So like, for instance, here's my wedding ring. You know, if I, if I uh, take a hammer and crush this ring, is, well, is crushing a ring with a hammer a big deal morally? No, but this is my wedding ring. <laughs> that matters now. This is a different context. So the context of rebelling in the Old Testament is a covenant with God and people, God and mankind saying, I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people, Israel. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to protect you, but you will follow my laws. Will you covenant to obey me? Will you covenant to follow me? And they say, yes, we will covenant to you. And so this is a big deal. It's a big deal. That this this hopefully elevates your understanding of the offenses in the under the Old Testament. Um, why didn't they follow the laws? Because this, because they're rebels. <laughs> That's why they don't follow the laws. Should we push the same capital punishment rules, the same quote same capital punishment rules on all nations? Nope, I don't think we're supposed to. I have teaching on the Old Testament law on that, but I do think capital punishment is morally good, and I do have a video on that, and I'd like to change all your minds on that one too because I do think that the Bible is pretty clear on this issue. So I really hope that's helped. Let's go to question number five. Sarah Merriman says, Hi, Mike. How does Ecclesiastes 9, 4 through 6 reconcile with Paul's statement that to live is Christ and to die is gain? Am I misreading it? Thanks for your ministry. All right, let's look at Ecclesiastes. Uh, I think about Ecclesiastes a lot. It's a really unique book in the Old Testament. Sometimes we miss this because we think the Bible's just like a Sunday school book for like children or something. I don't know how anybody seriously reading the Bible thinks that. I didn't grow up in the church, so like I don't, I didn't never had that view of the Bible. But um, but there's some some very varied types of books in the Old Testament. Ecclesiastes is really unique. There's nothing like it anywhere else in the Bible. It's it's wisdom literature. Sure, it falls in that category, like Psalms, right, or Proverbs, or I should say Proverbs is wisdom literature. Um, Psalms isn't exactly, but the um, or maybe some would say it is. I'd rather not get into that debate. All right, Ecclesiastes nine, Ecclesiastes nine four through six. Nothing like Ecclesiastes. Let's read the passage. But he who is joined with all the living has hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. I like that phrase, by the way. A living dog is better than a dead lion. Um, people who go for greatness at the cost of their own existence <laughs> made a mistake. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Their love and their hate and their envy have already perished, and forever they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. Okay, um, so two things for context with Ecclesiastes. I think Ecclesiastes uses the phrase under the sun. Maybe I could be wrong. My understanding of Ecclesiastes, under the sun, to mean effectively in a godless universe, in a universe apart from God, without considering God, if I look at the world and, and evaluate it in that context, under the sun. I think it tends to use the phrase in, the, in that context, which is why Ecclesiastes will say things that seem contradictory, right? Like the dead know nothing. They have no reward. They have no reward. There's no future for them. The memory of them is forgotten. Their love and their hate and their envy have perished, all these things. But when you get to Ecclesiastes 12, the end of the book, um, look at his counsel. He says, remember also your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come um, and the years draw near in which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. He's like, serve God while you're young. And you have the energy for it, um, <clears throat> and uh, before you're, you're old and the, and the hard times come, and 
here at the end of the book, he says, Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and like nails um, are fixed by... Like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making them, This is an interesting verse, not related to my actual, what I'm looking for. But um, <clears throat> of the making of many books, there's no end. And much study is weary, weariness of the flesh. It's, it's tiring to study a lot. Verse 13, final verse, two verses of the book. Look at his conclusion. The end of the matter, all his all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment and every secret thing, whether good or evil. There is some future judgment where God's going to test all your works. I think that Ecclesiastes needs to be taken in the light of the, the, the um, under the sun concept. He's like, hey, let me isolate myself to this life and let me evaluate life without looking at the afterlife. And he's in that section, I think, in Isaiah, in Ecclesiastes 9. So I think that's what's happening there. And then later on in Ecclesiastes, he comes back to the wisdom of saying, you know what, fear God and keep his commands because everything will be brought under judgment. So I think that, um, um, that that might help answer your question. Now, Paul's statement to live as Christ and die as gain is coupled with other things that Paul says, where he's suggesting that when he dies, he's going to be right in the presence of God. And that's how I take it. Not everybody would agree there, but that's how I take it. I do think that's the right understanding of it. Um, the, uh, yeah, I think, I think the best way to understand Ecclesiastes there is just that. It's like, yeah, Paul's talking about what actually happens. Ecclesiastes is doing a thought exercise, which concludes with bringing us back to the reality of God and judgment. All right, number six. Walker Thompson says, I have a good understanding of God's love and forgiveness in my head, but I have trouble living as though I believe it in my heart, and I still feel condemned at times. First John 4, 16 through 18, any advice? Um, the advice partly is, I think, in that verse you just referenced. <clears throat> so we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us. God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God. This is a really interesting thing is you've come to know that God loves you, but he's also like, and, and believe the love that God has for us. This is like a really important part of at least my Christian experience when I got saved was realizing that God loved me. Um, that's powerful. I know he loves me because of the cross. It proves it. It's not just a feeling in my heart. Rather, my feelings are responding to the fact of his His um, offering for me. Behold the love that, that God has bestowed upon us, right? That we would be called children of God. And it says, God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us so that we might have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. So when we have love perfected in us, that is like I've received God's love I believe God's love, and then I begin to love others. Th this creates a situation where my heart feels pretty confident. Uh, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. So if you're fearing, if you're a Christian and you're still fearing, I think that it's because there's something mal malfunctioning right, in, your, in your appreciation of God's love for you. We love because he first loved us. And um, then there's the passage that I think I'd like to point out, um, which is pretty close to this, 1 John 3.20. <clears throat> By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. Right? Th this is the love that we live out before others. And remember this. Okay, this is answering your question, I think, Walker. Um, that... Uh, let us love in, in not just in word and deep or in talk, but in deed and in truth. So we're, we're called to love others. That's remember that that's key by this. We shall know that we're of the truth and reassure our heart before him. That's important. I want my heart to be assured before him. And how am I going to do that? Verse 18. I'm going to live out the love of God towards others. Walker, I'm going to suggest this. When you feel some brokenness in your ability to appreciate the love that God has for you, go out of your way to show love to somebody else because you living out the love of God towards others is one of the ways in which your heart becomes reassured before God because you see the love of God flowing through your life. 
But then we read on. It says, um, for whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows everything. We looked at this first last week, actually. But I think that the implication of the passage is that, hey, there are times, Christian, when you feel condemned, but it's not true. God's greater than your heart. He knows everything. This gives me permission as a Christian to not look at my own heart and my assurance as if that's the thing that has to prove I'm saved. Assurance doesn't prove salvation. Lack of assurance doesn't prove condemnation. That's interesting, isn't it? I do think that that's something we can, we can hold to biblically. I think that when we look at demonstrating my salvation, I look at the life. I, well, two things. The, the, the faith I have, do I truly believe these truths about Jesus? And I look at the life I live and I ask, has my life been changed by Christ? Not is it perfect, but have I, do I have a tangible change or tangible um, evidence that my life has actually been impacted by Christ? And those are the things I would look at. But ultimately, um, if I feel some lack of assurance for some reason still, God's greater than my heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God and then it affects our prayer life. So, Walker, my counsel to you is this. First, get your inspiration for God's love by looking at the cross, not your feelings, by looking at the cross, right? That you, you, Like you said, I know it's true, but sometimes I have a hard time like feeling it, so to speak. Those are my words, not yours, I think. Um, I guess you said you still feel condemned at times. Um, so you get it from the cross. You look at your life and you say, has my life actually been Im impacted and changed? Not am I perfectly holy, but I'm like, no, like I see it in my life. Like I, I've got the work of the Holy Spirit happening in my life. Um, then you should not feel condemned. And if you continue to point, point yourself towards serving and loving others and see if that has an impact on you. But do not stop prayer. Do not stop reading the word. Don't be crippled in engaging with God on a spiritual level. Just say, my heart's funky. There's um, sometimes married couples go through this. I, I, I've experienced uh, hearing about this where someone gets married and after they're married, they struggle and struggle and struggle to believe that their spouse actually loves them. Now, it's totally true that the spouse loves them, but they don't feel like their spouse loves them. And there's a point at which you have to say, well, I'm sorry you feel that way, but you're going to have to live like you know it until your feelings come around the corner. And that would be my encouragement on this as well. I hope it helps. Jill G has a question, says, what is your opinion on Paul's thorn? I heard it was his eyes, maybe from his encounter on the road to Damascus. He had Luke, a doctor with him during his travels, and he had others write his letters. So I'm not totally settled on the question of what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. Uh, personally, I, I'm inclined to think that it had a physical ailment connected to it. But um, sometimes we, we, we suggest like, Either it was a physical ailment or it was it was something demonic, right? And I'm not sure that if we should make it an either or scenario there. It could have been both. I mean, Satan was definitely attacking Job and that was definitely physical, right? So there was it wasn't like an either or thing. So let's look at what Paul writes on this. Um, so to keep me from being conceited, becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh. Now that's the phrase he's given, a thorn in the flesh. It's also called a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. Notice the terminology, he calls it an it, not a he, right? But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more this is interesting. I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So <clears throat> here's what we've got with a little bit of information. We got Paul introduces it as a thorn in the flesh. Okay, that sounds like a physical ailment. The description sounds physical. Do I think it's a literal thorn? No, it was something physical that was like a thorn in his flesh. Okay, um, he also calls it a messenger of Satan. This implies there's some sort of supernatural, demonic, satanic type activity behind it. But does that make it a demon is it actually a demon that's harassing him? I don't. I don't think so. Uh, personally, that's not my opinion. Some would say it is. That the whole thing is just a demon. I think rather, a satanic. God allowed, like with Job, he allowed Satan to, to mess with Paul in some fashion. But God's going to use it to keep him humble. 
he pleads with God that it should leave me. Well, the leaving me part probably refers to this, the way he introduced it, the thorn in the flesh, which sounds again like a physical thing. He says, my grace is sufficient. My power is made perfect in weakness. And when he talks about boasting in his weaknesses, this implies something new, I think, about this. Thorn in the flesh manifests weakness in Paul when it comes to his functions in ministry. Okay, well, that, that's that's interesting. So you could think that it's like a demon who just keeps like whispering in Paul's ear or something like that. But I, I think that um, more likely, because if it was just a demon that constantly stayed with him, there is this, there's, an, there's a, the, the casting out of demons, which was pretty common and normal at the time. And he doesn't seem to be talking about it in terminology that fits like the casting out of a demon. Instead, he identifies it as with not him, uh, an attack he's experiencing, but rather a weakness He's, that is ongoing in his life. So trying to figure out what this is, I'm thinking it's probably physically related, spiritually and spiritually caused, but physically physical in result. And it's not a demon that's constantly with him, harassing him, but rather they, that some sort of like, a, like Satan or one of his minions is the source of this thorn in the flesh. But the thorn in the flesh itself is a physical weakness of some kind. So I think that um, we can piece together other things which you've mentioned in your question here. Um, uh, Jill, and there are things where Paul's writing and he says like, see with what large letters I've written you. And when Paul, it seems that when Paul wrote by with his own hand, he wrote very large letters. And this may be because he had, you could say he had vision problems. There's not really a lot of other reasons to write big letters unless it's, it's like a physical, maybe his arm is damaged, his arms are damaged. And so, you know, when he writes, he's, he's handicapped. So then he, he writes large letters because he doesn't have the fine motor control. That would also potentially explain it. But then there's the letters to the Corinthians where Paul says to them, like, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. This is a really interesting, um, let me see if I can find the passage real quick and not really no. Um, oh yeah, I know Galatians, Galatians. That, that's why I couldn't find it. I had the wrong book in my head. Um, so in this book, he says, um, it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. He had some sort of physical affliction, and that's why he preached to them in, Gal in Galatia. He did, he was going to maybe go somewhere else, and he detoured, perhaps stuck in Galatia. So some sort of physical ailment. That's why he stuck around. That's why he preached the gospel to them. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God in Christ Jesus. Now, it's natural to assume that Paul, whose handkerchief would heal people when he had a physical ailment, would appeal to Jesus for healing. But God doesn't heal him. There's some prolonged period of time and it, and it causes him to preach in weakness. Okay, this sounds a lot like the thorn in the flesh, doesn't it? So at least it fits it well. Um, then um, he says, what then has become of your blessedness? For I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. Now, the only motive I can think for them to gouge their eyes out and give them to Paul, because this is not a horror movie, it is instead that feeling when you have a loved one who's suffering physically and you think to yourself, if only I could take their place, right? If, if only I could give them my back to, to, to be strong for them instead of theirs. If I could give them my eyes so they wouldn't have the suffering that they've got, I would do it. This seems to say I had a bodily ailment that was pretty significant and affected my eyes a lot. And he had it for a, for a um, significant period of time. And Paul then in another place refers to the thorn in his flesh. This is probably the same thing. So I, I'm thinking that um, the bodily ailment has something to do with his eyes. This, this could mean just poor vision. Okay, that's possible. But it could also mean other things. There's all kinds of weird eye diseases and stuff like that you can get. Um, it would be a trial to you. His condition would be a trial to them. Um, that potentially could have caused them to scorn and despise him. Okay, well, that's not just you're having bad vision, like you've got, you know, you're nearsighted or something. Rather, this seems to be like there's something visual that's disgusting to people. Okay, so there's one tradition that says Paul had running, his eyes were running and stuff like that. Combine this with when he writes to them, he writes with large letters and all that. So I'm thinking that the trial, the, the, this physical ailment um, was probably the thorn in the flesh, what we read about in Galatians. All right, let's look. Oh, by the way, some are not going to like this. And part of the reason they don't like it is because they believe God would never allow such a thing. Um, I think that that's a thoroughly unbiblical view. I think God uses suffering for his glory and for our good all the time. And that if you don't hold that view, you're going to be very, it's going to bring you a lot of challenges and problems. And you're going to cause problems for others 
because you're going to respond to their suffering, not with grace and kindness, right? But with um, promises that aren't true and weird behaviors. <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about. All right. Jonathan question says, uh, or Jonathan has a question. I guess he put question. Maybe his name's question. Only Jonathan knows. All right. Hey, Pastor Mike from Galatians 5. What does it mean to walk in the spirit? And do you have any pastoral advice for a new disciple on this subject? Thanks. All right. Okay. This is like, let me just acknowledge big question. Beautiful question. Wonderful question. Don't think that my little answer here gives you the full scope of what this means to walk in the spirit. But let's look at some of what is said here so that we can hopefully understand it a little bit better or at least be reminded of some of the truths about it. Okay. Um, Jonathan. Paul says, um, I say, okay, well, let's talk about what he says not to do. <laughs> okay. Um, he says, uh, I'll start at verse 13. Um, for you are called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Um, freedom from the law, freedom from the policies, all the rules and stuff like that, and especially the ceremonial type stuff in the law. But he's like, but don't use your freedom. A lot of people who are very into liberty as Christians, their freedoms they have, like, don't judge me. I can do that. I have liberty. They're, the, the, the danger they have is not um, the, the legalism side. The danger they have is going to be that they will be using their freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Is that what, what was a genuine freedom becomes a sinful carnal bondage. Um, so he says, through love, serve one another. So he points us towards how can I help and serve and bless others? Not just what freedoms do I have, but what are they for? They're for the service of others. And that changes things. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Pointing outwards towards others. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you're not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the spirit. Or some, would, some translations, walk in the spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. This is Paul's formula for how to not sin. That's kind of how I see this, Jonathan. Paul's like, hey, walk by the spirit and you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. And then Paul makes very clear that the that Christians, you're going to have um, desires or inclinations towards bad things and good things. And he assigns the source of those to the flesh and the spirit. And when he says flesh, he doesn't just mean physical body. That's a mistake a lot of people make because we never use the term flesh outside the Bible in normal culture to refer to what Paul's talking about. So you got to take Paul's use. He's not just talking about your physical body. Your, 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 your finger isn't, isn't wicked in that sense. Um, but the flesh represents all the bad desires I have. And he goes, walk by the spirit. He's talking about good desires, positive desires. Uh, but these positive desires are not just part of the human nature, like conscience or awareness of right and wrong. It's rather a result of salvation. So, you, so a human who's not saved will still have conscience. They'll still have awareness of conviction of sin and all those sorts of things. But the Christian has something in addition to that, the spirit in us, the Holy Spirit in us. And he's pulling us towards the will of God and the love of other people. And we're also pulled by the flesh. So this is the battle you and I face between the spirit and the flesh. I have every day, the flesh, every day, the spirit. And I want to die to the flesh. I want to deny the flesh. I want to walk in the spirit. And I, I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. So let's read on to look at how he describes what walking in the spirit, walking by the spirit looks like. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh for these are opposite to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. So here's me in the middle and the, the spirit has desires, the flesh has desires and I'm to pick between them. Meaning I have a choice right now what kind of life I'm going to live as a Christian. Walk in the spirit, walk in the flesh. Verse 18, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Okay, so I, I, this goes back to his previous discussion about the law. He's just saying, look, if you're just going to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit towards holiness in your life, you're not under the law. You don't need the law in the same sense in which the Judaizers were trying to put it on the Galatians. They were trying to tell them get circumcised and come under all the 613 commandments and all of the rules. Like He's like, that, that's not what you need. You need to walk in the Spirit. You're, then you're not under the law. You're going to be in the law of love. Verse 19, now the works of the flesh are evident... Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, in, uh, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Meaning, yeah, bad stuff, sinful stuff, sinful attitudes, right? Like jealousy, sinful actions, like uh, drunkenness, 
orgies or, or sexual perversions, that sort of thing. So he warns. He goes, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Like you're, a, it's it's interesting the, the the tough challenge that we get with with the writing here, and I struggle with it all the time. Is this question of, okay, I'm 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 a Christian, I have the flesh still pulling on me, according to Paul. This is why you don't do the things you want. But it, he implies in verse 21, if you are just living that lifestyle, if you're just in the flesh, and that's just how you live all the time, I'm telling you, like people who live like this don't inherit God's kingdom, and it's kind of like a vague, almost threat, like hey. Maybe you're not really a Christian. Is is that's how I take it, um, and I think it's a warning for those who are living a very carnal lifestyle. And I say this carefully: maybe you are not really a Christian, and that's why he warns them. People who live this way don't inherit God's kingdom, guys. Like that's the it's a warning thrown out there. I feel that even the authors of the of the uh, of the New Testament looked at some people and weren't sure if they were saved or not. They were like, look, if you were living this way, I would know you're a Christian. Over here, you're living really bad. You claim you're a Christian. It's like, I'm in doubt. I don't know about you. And that's kind of my perspective on some people as well. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit. Now let's talk about walking in the Spirit. This is what it looks like. Walking in the Spirit doesn't mean that like I wake up and I, I hear the Lord tell me like, Mike, turn, open your Bible, turn it to Job 4, verse 3. And I read Job 4, 3. And someone, I know one of you are looking it up right now to see if that means something special. I don't know. I just picked up random numbers. But, um... But it's, you know, and then I go to work and I'm on my way to work and I stop to get gas and the Holy Spirit tells me, like, talk to this person right now. Tell them this for me. Tell them that for me. And some think that's walking in the Spirit. I don't think that's Paul's. I'm not, okay. I'm not saying the Holy Spirit won't do that. I'm not saying God would never tell you, go talk to this person. What I'm saying is that when Paul uses the term walk in the Spirit, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about this. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things there is no law. So, um, walking in the Spirit looks this way. You, you, you walk in love. You experience the joy of, of the salvation you have in Christ. You have peace, right? Not peace in the sense of like, I'm settled with a decision. Like, it's not about decision-making in this passage. Decision-making is important, but that's not what this is about. This is peace like... I'm at peace with God and I'm extending peace towards everyone I can be at peace with. Like Romans says, live peaceably with any, with any, everybody as much as it depends on you. Like that's peace. Patience towards others. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All this kind of thing. Um, that's a fruit of the spirit in your life. So living godly with godly attitudes and godly actions, that's walking in the spirit. Yeah. I hope that helps. All right, number nine. Bray Herb or Bree Herb says, What is the difference but, but biblically between doubt and unbelief? Are there are either a sin? Um I'm not sure that they're perfectly in these categories. Um like unbelief, to me it's like they overlap. Okay. There seems like there's some overlap between the two. Unbelief seems to be a stronger term that 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 I would say like um, you d you don't believe. That's how I would tend to use the term, right? Like someone who simply they reject belief. They're in unbelief is not just like I'm unaware of something, but rather I I reject that. I don't I don't I think that's wrong. It's kind of that attitude. Doubt seems like a more flexible term, at least the way I tend to use it. And I I would have to like do a search on the term doubt across scripture. Um, I'm not sure if it's consistently used the same way I'm about to explain. I'd have to look it up. But the way I use the word doubt, I, I tend to think of doubt as like a um, more of a spectrum. Okay, so obviously, a non-believer will doubt that the resurrection took place, but you could be a believer and also have some measure of doubt about some central thing because you're just struggling and you're going through hard times. So I think you can have doubt but not be unbelieving, or you can have doubt and be unbelieving. And, and to me, that's kind of what I would do with those words. Um, does scripture do that though? I'd have to survey through the various uses of the terms and then of course check back with the Greek to see if the English usage refer references a difference in Greek terms. I don't really know off the top of my head the difference there. But let me give a couple examples that won't help you with the terminology, but it might help you with the concepts. So John the Baptist clearly has some doubts about Jesus in the gospel. In, uh, in, in the latter part of his ministry, he's in prison. He's going to be killed by Herod not too long after this. And... 
he there sends a message to Jesus. Now remember, he was the one who says, I saw the Holy Spirit descend upon him. He's the one I was sent to tell you about. But in prison, John has some kind of doubts. Unbelief, no. Doubt, yeah. Okay, I'll use that terminology. And he sends a message to Jesus through his through his disciples. And he's like, hey, ask Jesus, are you really the one to come? Now, you wouldn't ask this question if you didn't believe Jesus. He obviously thinks Jesus is like the anointed of God. He, he's all these things. But something's true about Jesus. Like, I'm just, I'm confused. Okay, so he's like, just confirm with him. <laughs> I got that right. Like, you're the one, right? And so Jesus answers like, hey, look at the scripture. I'm fulfilling the scripture. And the subtle short version of this is, John, I'm the one. It just turns out the one isn't going to do the things you exactly thought he was going to do when you thought he was going to do them. And so there's John's confusion. He's conf his expectations are a little bit off, so he's confused about Jesus, but Jesus confirms that he is the one. I don't think John was in unbelief at any point there. I think he was struggling with some, some questions he didn't know how to answer and he, some inconsistencies he didn't know how to reconcile. Turns out his expectations were wrong, and that, I think, reconciled it for him. Um, let's go to another example. There's a man who asks for Jesus for healing for his family member. I, I think it was his son. Totally space on who it was. Uh, healing for a family member, for somebody. And he said, Jesus says to him, all things are possible for him who believes. Meaning like, I can do this, but you need to trust. You need to believe me. And he says to Jesus, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Now, here's an example, I guess, in scripture where even unbelief doesn't mean rejection of the truth of Christianity. Because he says, I believe, help me with my unbelief. And this explains, the okay, it might be a clumsy use of language, but it explains human nature so well. Don't you guys feel it? I totally get saying, I believe, help my unbelief. Like, this makes total sense to me. Some would be like, no, there's just total confidence and zero confidence and there's nothing in between. And I'd be like, well, I don't, that's the world you live in, but a lot of us don't live there. And, um... And this man didn't, wasn't there at the moment. I believe, help my unbelief. So here's a guy who's, who's uh, struggling. And Jesus, he accepts it. He heals the man's uh, relative. Some of you guys know who it is. I just space on it right now. But, um, but yes, so what unbelief then is really dangerous in Scripture? And I think the unbelief we read about is when you see the work of God, you have reason to trust and believe, and you reject it. Or the unbelief that results, in, like, so the Pharisees who, who um, had heard so many stories about Jesus' miracles and they continue to reject him, right? This, this, was, this was like a more accountable, like, unbelief in the sense of you are not, you've rejected Jesus, like, in that sense. You've rejected Jesus. So the person who's like, Jesus, I want you. Jesus, I, I trust you, but I'm also concerned. I'm doubting. They're received by Christ. The person who's like, I reject you, I reject you, I reject you, like that attitude that's a different category. And if you want to call that doubt and unbelief, that's cool. I guess scripture doesn't use those terms in that consistent way, at least in the case of the one guy. All right. Number 10. Let's go to the next question. Dilly guy says, how does receiving the Holy Spirit work? In Acts, there are two times the Holy Spirit's poured out in chapter two on Jews and then on Gentiles in chapter 10. But every other time is passed by laying on hands. Acts 8 14 through 18 and 19, 6. Okay, I'm going to grant your description there. I think that's accurate. Okay, the Holy Spirit's poured out in particular in Acts 2, Acts 10, and this Jew Gentiles, very important distinction there. Dilly guy, you got it right on. That's an important theological thing that's happening in the book of Acts there. Um, every other time it's passed by the, uh, he is passed by the laying on of hands. And we read about that um, in Acts as well. So this is why Simon the sorcerer tried to like bribe the disciples. Hey, uh, how much money do you want me to pay you to get your power to give the Holy Spirit by laying on hands? Here's my thought. This is initial. It is not permanent. Okay. Um, you asked for my thoughts. Here's my thoughts. <laughs> um, my thoughts are that in the book of Acts, we see um, the Holy Spirit initially coming generally speaking through not just any christian laying hands but the apostles laying hands the apostles specifically now i think this has a really important function in the history of the church that is the apostles were the ones who would uh, they would guarantee the doctrines of christianity were accurately portrayed these guys these apostles they would preach the doctrines of christ accurately and they would be able to lay the foundation that we have enshrined in the New Testament, all the doctrines and the teachings we've got there. So the Holy Spirit came specifically through their laying on of hands. 
But I don't think that this becomes a rule for, for later on because A, there are no continuing apostles. So there doesn't become a rule for how it has to happen like that. Because it wasn't just any old church leader, right? It was the apostles in particular. Um, but also, it's a little more varied in Acts. So in Acts chapter 10, well, in Acts 2 and 10, uh, the Holy Spirit is poured out, but there's no laying on of hands at all. So the, the Holy Spirit comes upon those gathered in the upper room in Acts 2, and there's nobody laying hands on anybody. It's just, boom, Holy Spirit's just working powerfully, showing the initiation of a new phase in salvation history. And then in Acts 10, Peter preaches the gospel to Cornelius and those guys, and the Holy Spirit comes upon them. Peter's shocked. Like, one of the apostles is there, but he didn't lay hands on them to receive the Holy Spirit. He's shocked, and he's like, whoa. And he was there to witness, because again, they're the guarantors of the doctrines. So he's there to witness the work of God. It just happens. The Holy Spirit comes upon him, and um, and boom. When uh, when Paul gets saved, this is done apart from the apostles. They don't They don't commission him. They don't bring him in. So what I'm saying is that, though the standard thing is, the apostles are securing the doctrines of the church by being the vessels through which the Holy Spirit is introduced into other people's lives. That's not always the case in Acts. It's just a general thing to lay the foundation. We don't have apostles afterwards. So I would say my loose answer is the Holy Spirit can come upon you because you simply pray and receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can come upon you and, and um, because someone lays hands on you, that there isn't like a rule that has to be followed universally on that topic. That would be my current thinking on that topic. I hope it gives you something to consider. Number 11, anonymous question. Hi, I have to read The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks for school, but Oprah did a movie on it. Since she denied that Jesus is the only way, I don't know if I should drop the class. Thoughts? Okay, so I would... Okay, um, if... I would only encourage you to drop the class if you really are worried you're going to be led astray. Like if you feel, and, and this is going to take a lot of, I'm going to, I'm going to call you a uh, friend because I, I don't want to call you anonymous. All right, friend. Um, this is going to potentially be awkward moment for you right here. Um, you know you. Are you one who is easily led astray? Where you find yourself falling into conspiracy theories, um, get rich quick schemes, <laughs> um, uh, being misled by bad spiritual leaders. If that's a tendency of yours, then I would say, don't read it, stay away from it. But that's not because you can't read non-Christian books or even anti-Christian books as a Christian. That's because you're guarding your own heart. You're guarding your own life. You're guarding your own walk with Jesus. You don't want to be misled. And you, and you just know, I just, Hey, not everybody has the discernment to work through these things. Now, if that's not the case, if that's not you, friend, then what I'm going to encourage you to do is read it and read it carefully and read it thoughtfully and maybe look if there's a Christian response to it online that you can find and try to find the problems that are there, not just so you could react with anger or something like that, but rather so you can discern because guess what? You're surrounded by a bunch of classmates that are all reading it too. Maybe you can become equipped to understand these things so that you can minister to them and talk to them to lead others who have been influenced by a, a, a book I've never heard of, <laughs> The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, um, there could be a lot of good that comes out of you reading this. It's it's entirely possible. So may, uh, may God give you wisdom to know if that's a good idea or not. Number 12, Bagbo Bilgins, uh, the bobbit from the pyre. Um, Bagbo Bilgins says, are, are our deaths appointed to us in both time and manner if a person dies being hit by a car on the corner of Times Square, was it always going to end that way? Thank you for all you do. Okay, so in a sense, yes, and in a sense, no. Um, in the relevant sense, in the most important sense, I care about telling people no. Let me try to explain my two senses that I've just sort of come up with as categories off the top of my head <laughs> that hopefully help. Okay, so in one sense, um, God knows all the future actions of mankind and all the various things that are happening in, with physics in the universe. And he knows all of his decisions in response to those actions and his interventions and all that. So in a sense, God knows from eternity past that guy's going to get hit um, in Times Square, on the corner of Times Square by a car. And that's going to be his, his day, okay? Now, in the other sense, okay, let's zoom out away from God's omni, om omniscience for a second because you don't have that omniscience at all. Um, 
that man made real choices. Like that morning, that man could have gone to Times Square or maybe he could have gone somewhere else to to buy some candy at a, a local amazing candy store, giant six-story candy store full of every kind of candy. Just favorite place. The guy made a real choice to go to Times Square in this hypoth- hypothetical scenario instead of the candy store. Now, God knew that choice. Okay, here's the one sense. God knows the choice he makes, but the man made a real choice. God's knowledge didn't make him make the choice. He made a real choice and God knew what choice he would make, meaning that there are decisions we really make that truly impact what our fate is going to be, yet God knows what that fate will be in the long run. So what I'm trying to guard you against, Bagbo Bilgins, is the belief that you don't have a choice and that your fate, where you're going to die, where you're, where you're going to live, the life you're going to live is already decided for you and you don't have any decisions to make about it. That's a dangerous and I think very unbiblical perspective on things. That's a type of fatalism because honestly, if that's true, why do I ever even get out of bed at all? I think people who believe that kind of fatalism, that they tend to make a lot of bad decisions And they don't feel responsible because they think it's the hand they were dealt and they don't realize they're making choices here. And so that to me is very harmful. Now, from the beginning in the garden, we have a decision that Adam and Eve are making about a tree. As you continue on, you have decisions that people are making about sin and the consequences of God's judgment for that. When Jesus enters the picture, you have real decisions to make about whether you'll receive or reject Christ. And the the whole Bible is presenting you with decisions between one world and the next, one kingdom and the other kingdom, God's kingdom. These decisions are so important. The last thing I want somebody thinking is that they make no choices. And I realize that there are those who do hold that view. I just think it's very unbiblical and causes a lot of trouble for individuals. Uh, Fatalism makes you make bad decisions, right? Nothing you say is going to make it true. Believing it won't make it true. But believing it may cause you to make bad decisions, thinking it's not your responsibility, it's not your fault. That was just going to happen anyways. And the Bible doesn't doesn't respond to people like that at all. (laughs) It's like, Y'all should have done better. All right, we have our all of our questions for today. I'm hitting question number 13 now. So you guys, I'm un- unable to get more than 20. And we've got all of them ready to go. So Andrew Hansen says, how should churches handle their local online only congregants? This is a big dilemma in my church uh, leadership right now. Let's assume that it's safe to return to church in person. Um, I don't know how churches should handle them, partly because of this, Andrew. I find it very intimidating to tell and this is kind of how it's going to be heard by a lot of people. I know there's a lot of pastors list that listen to this um, YouTube channel, podcast, or on BibleThinker.org, wherever you're finding it. And I'm not trying to make a judgment on what your church should do. Um, I don't really know the right answer, Andrew, on how all these things ha- are, are to be handled. For instance, there are some churches where the majority, let's just show the complexity of it, where the majority of the congregation are elderly. And they're under g- much greater risk of issues with COVID. So how do you handle that? You know, my, my own mother has COPD and I know at least I'm not a doctor, but her doctor tells her that if she gets COVID, she will probably die. That's kind of a big deal. Um, and if I were to say, well, churches should definitely tell the congregants, you need to come back into fellowship. Does that mean that some pastor calls my mom and, she, and he's like, Hey, Karen, you really got to come back to church. You know, Mike, your son says you guys time to come back to church. And then now someone's risking their life because of advice I gave online of a situation I was ignorant of. Um, yeah. All that to say, Andrew, God give you guys wisdom. Um, I, I think that we need to be slow and thoughtful and careful on these things. And that sweeping answers that we try to put like a blanket over every church in America while not considering their unique situations are unhelpful and create division in the body because it just creates judgment over everybody. As soon as you meet a church that's not doing what your blanket answer is, now you're judging them for it. And I don't feel the right to, to do that. So uh, God give us wisdom. Cayman says, what is the day of the Lord? Um, that's actually something I've, I've looked into and um, specifically the phrase, the day of the Lord in scripture. And one of the assignments we had back when I was in the school ministry was um, define the word day of the Lord as it's used in the Bible. And so I came up with some possible definitions of the word, the day of the Lord. And then in, you know, 
to to test the and here's the, a good thing to test your definitions you look at its usage in different contexts to see if you're defining it properly in other words you take your definition and wherever you see the phrase day of the lord you plug in your definition and you ask if that sentence makes any sense now and here's what i discovered the day of the lord is not one time in the bible the day of the lord is a term that's used to talk about some things that have already happened and some things that will happen in the future there is like in a sense a great day of the lord we're talking about like the time around the second coming of christ where there's great judgment but then there's also after i'm premillennial so after the millennial reign there's something else that you could refer to as the day of the lord right when that's when there is final judgment not just judgment coming locally on the earth but final judgment like where our eternal our eternal homes are um, we enter then there's passages in the old testament that talk about the day of the lord coming and it already came in Joel, right? And it already happened. And it was Nebuchadnezzar. And it was the day of the Lord. So what is what is a definition of the day of the Lord that fits all these different things? I think my thought on this, for what it's worth, is the day of the Lord refers to a time, any time, when God is acting very directly and interventionally in history, often in judgment. So the day of the Lord is a time when God is acting interventionally in, in, in a deliberate way, act, actively, often in judgment, um, dealing with mankind. So then it can, ref there isn't just one day of the Lord. Like what day is, it? is it Tuesday? Is it three years long? Is it, but rather it's like, oh no, no, it's a more of a flexible term. That's how I would take it. Kumbo Munsaka says, hi Mike, serious question here. How would you respond to a JW who says revelation 314 proves that Jesus was created when it says he's the beginning of creation? Interested in hearing you on this. Um, revelation 314 I would, I, first off, I wouldn't want to answer without like spending a little bit of time just refreshing myself on it. So um, you're going to get my, Kumbo, you're going to get my not sat down, thought about it, looked it up in the Greek, checked all the resources and all that answer. This is more off the cuff and I don't remember all the details of this stuff, of this particular issue off the top of my head. So um, to the angel of the church of, in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. So let's just take the English for a second. Um, he's the beginning of God's creation. What does that mean? The, the first created being? But it doesn't, it's not worded that way, is it? He's the, I, let me show you guys the text. Sorry. Jesus is the beginning of God's creation. It doesn't say he is the first created being. That's how they're going to interpret it, the JW here. He, he's the first created being and everything else is then created through him. But where does it say that now if Jesus was created, like if you can establish in other scriptures that Jesus was created, then I can understand how you might interpret this to be, well, the beginning, then he was the first created. It's because there's something about Jesus that he is the beginning of the creation of God. Except when you go to other passages in scripture that talks about Jesus' role in creation, like John 1, right? He's the in the beginning with God, right? He The word was God. He, so he's with God. He is God. He, this is the plurality of persons in God. And all things were made through him. Everything was made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. So this is easy. If it was made, it was made through Jesus. Now, if Jesus doesn't exist, can Jesus be made through Jesus? No, that's irrational, right? Everything that was made was made through him, meaning he has to exist for the creation of everything else to happen through him. And there's nothing that, it, that, that was made, created, right, that wasn't made through him. So he already exists and then everything that it was created. So how is he the beginning of God's creation? Because he's the agent through which God creates. That would be how I'd interpret the Revelation passage. The, that's consistent with, I think, the wording that's there. He is... The beginning of God's creation. There's also other places in scripture where Jesus is called like the Alpha and the Omega. So the beginning and the end, titles of deity are used in the book of Revelation for Jesus. And so we're, we're not getting um, any reason to think that he was created there. Um, I think it's just a strange phrase, the beginning of God's creation. And without more context, it might seem flexible. Maybe the JW is like, I could use this. But when you look at the rest of what scripture says about Jesus, um, Colossians is, one is another example. 
Um, he himself was not made. And so he's the beginning of God's creation because he's the agent of creation. He's the one through whom creation is made. So creation begins through him, with him. Um, all right, let's go to number 16. Rachel Anderson says, how do you recommend bringing up apologetics with unbelieving friends? Thank you for your teaching. You've helped me grow. I'm very happy to hear that, Rachel. Um, here's what I recommend is, um, I would try to start by asking them questions. So this just can be tough, you know, um, because what I want to know is this. I, I've had enough apologetic conversations with people to realize, Rachel, that sometimes you can go on proving things to them that have no impact on them whatsoever because they don't care if those things are true. So I want to find out what they care about first. So if, 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 it's, if I prove the Bible was inspired, would that matter to my friend? If I prove that Jesus resurrected from the dead, would that matter to my friend? Like one guy I talked to, he didn't care about any of that stuff. I did a bunch of apologetics with him. And then at the end of it all, he was like, look, Mike, I just want to like be a good dad. And I want to just like live my life. You know, I don't really want to worry about all this stuff. The more I proved to him that it was true, the more he realized he didn't care about any of that. He just doesn't want it to interfere with the life he's living. And so I pushed on him a different way. I, you know, hopefully in a nice or a helpful way, a friendly way. Even if it wasn't nice. <laughs> I was like, how are you being a good dad if you aren't raising your daughters to know the truth about God and know the truth about eternal life? And that may have given him more to think about than all the apologetics I did. So I'm going to suggest, Rachel, that you try to determine what they care about. And that's only going to happen with questions. So what's your opinion of, of, of God or like um, what keeps you from being a Christian? Maybe that's a good example. Like what keeps you from being a Christian? Oh, well. Um, it's too strict. I don't really like the strictness of it all. Oh, oh really? That's like it. I, I thought it was, I, I had to prove the Bible's inspired or something. Like, you might want to find out what's going on with them. Now, maybe they go, well, the Bible's full of contradictions. And then I want to ask them, if I was to show you it's not, how would that impact you? Like, I want to know if there's stakes. There's something that's going on here. Try to use wisdom to find what they care about, what matters to them. And if nothing matters to them, then your task is to make something matter. And your first apologetics task is to make it matter. Then you can build your case. You know, if they don't care about whether God exists or not, make them care. What would be the implications of there being no God? So like William Lane Craig has a video, a teaching he does on this about like the absurdity of life without God. And I think that's a very helpful video in raising the awareness of people that it matters that God exists. So like he doesn't even make the case for God there. He talks about the absurdity of life without God. This is where apologetics comes down to like, I don't just want to answer questions. I want to help people see the light. And I pray that God gives you wisdom, Rachel. Find out what they care about. If they don't care, you want to stir up care. And that's a different task than proving the truth of something. It's showing why it matters. So those are my thoughts. Number 17, Ben Kirchhofer says, how should I respond to the attitude of so-and-so is moral without a belief in God. Therefore, they are better than someone who needs religion to be good. Okay, I love this. Okay, remember how we talked about questions sometimes have assumptions? Um, sometimes, I mean, statements are the same way. They can have assumptions. So I'm going to read the statement again, and then I want to talk about the, the assumption. And Ben, this is what I would encourage you to try to undermine is the assumption. So the claim is so-and-so, let's say his name is Bob, all right? Bob is a moral person without belief in God. Therefore, Bob's better than you because you need religion to be good. Okay, so religion becomes a, de a, 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 um, a supplement for immoral people to make them moral. But people who are good, they don't need religion. This implies a couple things. One, that, that um, the reason we need religion is to, con is to make us conduct our behavior well. Okay, but that's generally not what Christianity is trying to teach, right? So we don't believe, and Christians, if you're thinking this, I hope that you'll reconsider because scripture refutes this, pointedly refutes this in Romans. The idea that, that we um, have moral beliefs because the Bible gives us moral beliefs, like otherwise I wouldn't even know what right and wrong was, that is not a Christian view at all. Romans 1, it says that, that, the laws written on our hearts, or Romans uh, chapter 2, the, the laws written on our hearts, that we have this awareness of right and wrong because 
God has given it to us as humans. Humans naturally have awareness of right and wrong. And it even implies that, that some people do good things and some people do bad things. And their conscience is bearing witness with them that they did something good or something bad. So the Bible doesn't suggest that everyone who doesn't have religion or believe in God or walk in God, that they're always doing immoral things all the time. This is not a biblical thing. And so I'm not going to defend that. Right? So so and so is a moral person without belief in God. Therefore, they're better than you. Okay, well, they can be better than me all they want in your opinion. But you're acting like I need religion in order to do anything good. I just need religion in to, to do the, the most good or the best good. That's one thing I, I would need Christian religion for, right? Because I want to love God and know God. And I can't do that without God. Okay? So you can't know God and serve God and worship God. Those are goods. You can't do that without God. So there's an, there's an example. But there's a, there's a subtle problem here is I am not primarily trying to bring religion into your life as a moral reformer for your behavior. I'm primarily trying to bring you the truth about the universe we live in, that there's a God and he loves you, that you've sinned, that there's judgment and hell if you reject and rebel against him, but that Jesus died on the cross, taking your sin upon himself, dying in your place, rose again from the dead, historically, factually supportable, so that you can put your faith and trust in him. And then it comes down to you having a relationship with him through faith. That God himself will enter your life and change you. Not just make you a better person for the sake of society. That is a side effect that generally happens. Now let me push back even more on the so-and-so's moral without belief in God so they're better than you. Um, it's not as though if I rejected Jesus, I would be completely immoral in every way. But I would be less moral. Because I wouldn't love God. Because as a husband, I wouldn't show the same patience towards my wife. There are times where I would be a worse husband if it wasn't for Christ in my life. Not only because of the work of the Holy Spirit in me, but also simply because of the fact that I will look at my wife and think, Lord, you're calling me to love her even if I don't feel like it all the time. You're calling me to be kind to her and patient with her and not to speak to her that way. I mean, in all the years of marriage, I've never called my wife a name. A bad name. I call her all sorts of names. <laughs> but, but I mean like a bad name. I've never called her a bad name. That would not be the case if it wasn't for my Christian faith. I'm sure that at least there would have been some name calling in there. Okay. So Christianity makes me a better person. And the way, Ben, the way this question's worded, they want to take a value of Christianity that it does generally make you into a more, more moral, not from non-moral to moral, but a, a better moral person. And they want to act like this is a bad thing, like a bad feature. Oh, this proves that Christianity is only for those bad people. But I think it's just uh, rhetoric. All right, number 18, Leah Carner says, what is a Christian's role to speak truth on cultural issues to non-Christian society? Just preach good news and individual hearts get changed? It seems preaching and homosexual against homosexuality hardens hearts. Um, let me uh, tackle this one like a bull in a china shop. <laughs> um, preaching the gospel involves telling culture that they are sinners who will stand in the presence of God to be judged for their sins. That's part of the gospel. So preaching, just preach good news and individual heart get, hearts get changed. I've heard this before. Like, I'm not here to, to condemn people. I'm here to preach the gospel of grace to people. And I'm like, you're being stupid. <laughs> like, I, don't know, I don't want to be me. I'm supposed to be a bull in a china shop. You're being very unaware of the nature of the gospel in scripture. On the lips of Jesus, on the lips of the apostles, through the writings of the New Testament, and on the, on the mouths of the early church, the gospel is the bad news met with the good news. If you preach only good news, good news, God loves you. That's not the gospel. It's true but it's not the gospel. In fact, if that's all you preach, good news, God loves you, you have misled people. That's your whole message. You've actually misled people because you've, you've allowed them to think that there's no alarm bells to go off, that there's no, there's no sickness that is being diagnosed and no cure that is being provided. So um, that being said, um, the Christian's role to speak truth on cultural issues is not, uh, here's where I would, I would say um, I'm hesitant on, on that role a little bit, which is, I don't think my role is to reform society, to not be Christian in genuineness, but to have Christian values where I'm trying to push 
Christian values onto people, but not necessarily the gospel of Christ. That to me, I'm falling short there. Okay, that's not my goal. My goal is not just to reform society to be more Christian-ish, but rather to make people into Christians by the preaching of the gospel that they would genuinely be transformed and changed. So those who would um, try to make the world a better place in ways that resemble Christianity, but aren't uniquely Christian is, is, is insufficient to be called the gospel. That sort of social fixing is insufficient. It's not enough. But you also said this, Leah, you said, um, it seems preaching against homosexuality hardens hearts. And um, it definitely does. Okay. Look, and I can tell you, I've had people where I'm, I'm like, they're like, were you a Christian? I was like, yeah, well, uh, what do you think about homosexuality? Like first question out of their mouth. And I know as soon as I answer this, they're going to hate me. <laughs> And it doesn't matter how gracious I am or how thoughtful I am. It's like, oh, there's, hatred is the next response to this. Um, but here's my encouragement to you. And again, I'm going to be an intentional bull in a china shop here. Preaching against homosexuality hardens hearts because people are sinful and they don't want to face it. The, the primary issue here. There's other issues going on. Sometimes people are jerks and they're rude in the way they present things. I get that. Jesus hardened hearts all the time. He even talks about it. He talks about how he's going to preach to them and they're going to become hard because of their own wickedness. What I'm going to suggest is that I don't want to be, conf okay, I, I want to avoid confusion when I preach against homosexuality People think, they genuinely think, this is the weird confusion of our culture, that I'm actually talking about certain people um, are born, they're born gay and they're condemned for being born gay. And that is not what I'm saying at all. I think, uh, I'm trying to say, and this is what people miss, and they miss it on purpose. They don't care that you're clarifying as a Christian. This is how I know the hardness is, is a spiritual issue and not just an intellectual problem. Because I'll explain this and it doesn't make a lick of difference with the people who it should matter to. But... Um, but the difference is that Christians are not saying you have an identity that you're born with that we condemn. No, we're saying you have a behavior that's ongoing that you need to stop. That's the preaching against homosexuality and adultery and fornication and looking at pornography and stealing and cheating on your taxes and lying um, and being selfish and being arrogant and being, being rude. <laughs> like that's a preaching against all the sins of mankind. And what we can't do is ignore that because people are going to get mad about it. And if I, you know, this is a spiritual issue. When you offer the clarity you're, you're offering and they're still mad at you the same, then you know. But my example here is Jesus. Jesus does this. He preaches and people get more angry. Remember, he, he's in Nazareth. He doesn't do too many signs there. He reads from the, the gospel of Luke. He tells them like this scripture is fulfilled in your presence. And the people are like, who is this Jesus? We know Jesus. He's nothing special, right? That's kind of their response. And Jesus, he says, you know, you're going to be telling me um, all these things. You're, you know, he predicts their their later actions towards him. But then he also makes makes these really offensive statements. He says, "These are there's times where Jesus is downright rude by some standards. I think he was rightly rude. He was the proper bull in a china shop on, on occasions. But um, he says to them, um, remember when um, Elijah helped the widow in Zarephath, how like the, he helps this Gentile. Remember when um, um, Naaman, the Syrian, is the only one that gets healed of leprosy in his day. And he gives examples of these times where Gentiles are the only people that are aided and helped by the prophets of God at that time. This is super offensive to them because they're like, you're telling us that we're the Jews and we're the people of God, but the Gentiles are going to get helped from, from you because we're rejecting you. This is, this is what he's, but he is saying it. So they take up stones to kill him, to murder him. Modern Christians, many of them would say, Jesus, you obviously said it wrong, right? Because, hold on. Because they would never have responded to you that way if you were speaking with the love of Christ. Except he's Jesus. <laughs> so I'm going to suggest our culture's hatred toward the Christian view on homosexuality has two components. One, a radical misunderstanding of that view. But once you clarify it, you have two. The second issue, a hatred towards God's holiness. So we still have to preach it. Now that I've offended everybody, here's my cat. There she is. Moxie just joined us. All right, let's go to the next question. <laughs> I am uh, 
hoping that I'm hoping that let's back up just a sec. I'm hoping that the confidence that I and and peace that I hope I have on these issues, peace with other people being mad, peace with somebody hating me, misunderstanding me on purpose and not caring. I'm hoping that that can be contagious. Number 19, Lena. Um, how slash why can our sins be imputed to Jesus? I'm confused about the transfer. If God is just, how can he let someone step in for our sin? How valid is the sacrifice if he was going to rise again? Okay, two very different issues you're dealing with. One is, um, how, how can it be just to place my sin on an innocent person and punish that person for what I've done? That doesn't seem just. The other question is, um, how can Jesus' sacrifice count for anything if he just rises three days later, right? On the third day, he rises back from the dead. How, why does it even matter that Jesus died? Um, okay, so the first question, I want to say... Um, the I deal with this in my series on penal substitutionary atonement, PSA. Penal meaning penalty, substitution meaning in our place, right? Atonement meaning, meaning the one who restores our relationship with God by dealing with our sins. So Jesus, he takes my penalty in my place to fix my relationship with God that I could uh, be joined to him. Now, um, how can our sins be imputed to Jesus? Let me give you a few examples of at least where that statement kind of breaks down a bit. So let's say that um, your brother, um, let's say, Lena, your brother gets uh, gets caught shoplifting or something like that. And there's a $3,000 fine that he has to pay as a result. I don't really know what fines are for shoplifting. I never get caught. So he, um, he gets caught $3,000 fine and you come and you pay it in his place. So you make the payment for it. How is that just? You're the one suffering for what he did wrong. Like it's coming from your bank account, not his. You paid it, but the court can accepted that. Why is that? I mean, on a strict perspective from your view here, that question, it would seem like it was in, it was unjust for you to pay for somebody else what they did wrong. Okay, well, you might say, but, that, but that's different. That's money. That's not like, say, going to prison or jail or, or having physical suffering as a result of what they did. And I'll be like, well, how different really is it? Like the $3,000 may have taken you four months of saving to be able to get, may have taken you a year of savings to be able to get. It seems like that was a lot of labor and work, sweat, right? Sacrifices maybe, you know. Um, you sacrifice something else, your new car. Now you're walking to work because you paid that debt. So it seems like they're, they're, the, the line's more blurry there than people realize. But let me add more to this, which is um, the, the role of representation in justice. So we have laws, even on our books, where an employer can be, can be punished for something their employee did on the job. And this can happen, this actually can happen even if the employer wasn't aware of what the employee did, even if the, it was against the rules for the employee to do it, right? He's not aware of it. He can still be punished because there's a sense of responsibility in which the authority has for the underling, even when the underling is doing something against what the authority said, right? An example, this could be your kids. You know, you, you take your kids to the park, you tell them, play nice with the other kids, and the other kids are all being having fun or whatever and your kids are mean to them and then you go to the parents and you're like I'm sorry and the parents look at you and they're like <laughs> and you're like I told them not to but I'm still going to take some responsibility for this um, even if it's not you know something I deserve I think that Jesus there's an element of this with Jesus Jesus pays for for us okay that that can be said um, he pays for my on my behalf as as the authority the one who is the creator of all things, he can claim responsibility for the things we've done, even though it was not his fault. Right? He just takes it upon himself because he has a role in authority. But there's a, there's a third way in which he represents us, and that is the whole Adam and Jesus parallel. Jesus is like Adam. Adam in the garden represents all of mankind. And he eats and we, and, and we all fall. And Jesus in the cross represents all of mankind. And we, we enjoy the, the fruit of it once we trust in Christ. But he stands there to represent us. He's like, I'm going to be the one who represents all of you. I will go on your behalf. I will, I will stand and I will take it all on my shoulders. He also is willing. And this is different. He's not like a little child. And, and a lot of times atheists will push against the cross as if, and, and, and some progressive Christians like, um, um, what's his name? 
I forget his name. Brian Zond. That's it. Um, they'll act like Jesus is like a little baby, like a, like a two-year-old toddler or something like that. And he's like a toddler's going to the cross and screaming and crying and, and everyone's dumping ju- judgment on him. Jesus isn't like that. Jesus is born for the purpose of representing mankind. He lives a perfect and sinless life. And then he voluntarily goes to the cross to represent all of us as our representative. So our sins are placed upon him to accomplish that justice. And when we trust in him, we identify with Christ and we partake of the benefits of that sacrifice. I think it all makes sense. I explain it in a lot more detail with actually a lot more references and quotes and support in my series on penal substitutionary atonement. And then you can find the link to that on the playlist on my um, website, biblethinker.org. There's a whole playlist of videos there or on my YouTube channel. Playlists are a little hard to find on YouTube. So we, I recommend going to the biblethinker.org website for that. Now you said, how is it valid if he's going to rise again the next, the three days, you know, the third day on Sunday? Um, Why wouldn't it be valid? I'm sorry. Why wouldn't it be valid? Um, The extremity of the punishment, not the duration of the punishment, I think is the point. People leave prison when their sentence is over. Jesus, the sentence is death. The sentence is suffering and death because our sentence is suffering and death. And Jesus, he experiences that. Something can be said for the quality of Christ that Jesus, when he dies, he, he is God with us. The quality of the sacrifice is of such a high value that it means more than just anybody dying and being dead for what, like a week? Would you be happy if he was dead for a year, like 10 years, a thousand years? Is that going to, is that going to make it better now? I think that the length of time is not the issue. It's the actual sacrifice itself. Um, Anyway, I talk more about that in the PSA videos. Please check them out. I go into great detail and I hope those things have helped you, Lena, to some degree. Number 20, last question for today. Christine says, a few times in the Old Testament, Jesus is referred to as the branch. Zechariah 3, 8, 6, 12, Jeremiah 23, 5. Why then is he referred to as the vine and us the branches in John 15, 5? Thanks for your ministry. I think your answer here, Christine, is just mixed metaphors. So let me talk about all the things Jesus, to help you understand why I I wouldn't worry about this. All the things Jesus is um, referred to as. The lion of the tribe of Judah, right? The, The bronze serpent that was lifted up. He's referred to as the rock that was struck, that Moses struck. He's referred to as the branch. He's referred to as the vine. He's referred to as the lamb that was slain. As the the lion and the lamb. Is he a lion or a lamb? Which is it? And the, the point is that these are all metaphors for different things. So he's a branch in the scripture. He's a branch meaning he's, he's um, one who grows up out of the descendants of Israel and Jacob and Judah. So he's he's... He's the fulf- he carries those promises and becomes the fulfillment of those promises that come through Israel. And, and uh, that's the branch connection that's there. Um, the implication also in those passages, I think, is that there's going to be... Uh, there's a transfer of... It's kind of a neat thing. To, and I don't have time to get into it, but there's a transfer, it seems, of responsibility of all of Israel and what they were all to do, fulfilling and obeying the law and all that, and to become a light to the Gentiles and how that transfers all to the branch. It all transfers from the tree to the branch, right? Now, when he calls himself the vine later on, it's a different metaphor. What he's saying here is that your belonging, the Israel would have thought of themselves as the vine. They're the vine. And that's how their thinking would be. And Jesus is like, I'm the vine. And if you don't abide in me, you're, 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 you're not, you're going to be cast out as a branch. So the statement here is Israel you're thinking your national belonging is your is your security. I'm telling you, you belonging to me is your security. It's not enough that you just are a descendant of Israel. You need to be attached to me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. And so the exclusivity of Christ is the purpose of that metaphor and the relationship we have with Jesus that we you know, we bear fruit through connection to him, through relationship and obedience, through knowing Christ. I'm going to just naturally bear fruit in my life. And I think that's just mixed metaphors where the branch, and then he says there's a vine here. These these are mixed metaphors, just like lion and lamb over here. (laughs) Um, Just like rock that was struck. Different metaphors for different purposes because there's a lot to learn about Jesus. And so God uses lots of metaphors and I'm glad he does. All right, y'all. I am 
going to be done. And I will see you Monday. I think a oh, quick announcement. Um, this Monday, I was going to teach the next in the Mark series. Where I was going to Mark 16. The last 12 verses of Mark, are they authentic? Are they not? I need more time to prepare this. I've spent a lot of time on it already, but I need a lot more time. I just need a lot more hours. And I know you all respect that. So you'll just have to be patient. It'll come a week later. I'm going to try this Monday to pull something together that I think a lot of you will be interested in. I don't want to announce the details because I'd hate to let you down. So give me some time this weekend. If I, if I can pull it together in the allotted hours I've given myself to prep it, then we'll do that. Um, so I'll probably still stream Monday. That's the plan. And uh, it'll be a surprise. <laughs> something I think a lot of you will be interested in, I hope. And um, uh, that's about it. So Lord bless you and keep you. And keep your walk with Christ simple. It really is about abiding in Jesus, which means that it's relational, man. <laughs> There's a relationship that goes on. You know, you can evaluate your marriage by looking at like, do am I, you know, do we have money? Are we living in a in, in this in the same house? Are we do we how frequently do we talk to each other? But there's another evaluation of that relationship, which is just like, how are you getting along? You know? That's I don't know how to quantify that, but that's like a that's like the most important part. It's just the two of you, are we connecting? And I think that your abiding in Jesus is about you connecting with God on a personal level. And that's really important. Remember that it's not just a checklist of things. There's a person you attach yourself to and it's Jesus. All right, y'all have a wonderful day.